Brothers and Sisters as well, and Sisters and Who's ready? All right, so uh, my name is Sam Alderson. Um, my mentor is Dr. Sanjay Kray, and the guy I was working with this summer is uh, Karen Flu. Um, before I get started, I'd just like to uh, thank you, too, for hosting me on our review. I'm Rick Linda for making this very great and the NSF for funding my project. Now, getting into my project, um, what I did is I uh, calculated optical properties of different materials using uh, density functional theory. Um, so from last time, basically what I did is I um, implied the necessity of a complex refractive index. So here we have the solution to the wave equation for electromagnetic wave. And using this relation here, which we also derived, um, we, can, we see that we can imply the use of a refractive index. Now, this k is a wave vector in the medium, while this k0 is a constant. That's the uh, wave number in um, a vacuum. Now, after we put this in, we can also we can change this to a complex value to um, accommodate for a k as the light wave enters the medium from the vacuum. And this creates, um, this in turn, you can also derive a, another term called the complex primitivity um, from Maxwell's equations. You get a constant C of the speed of light, which is 1 over square root of epsilon 0 plus 0, which are also constants. And a velocity, which depends on epsilon and mu, which are then dependent on the material. Um, for now, we typically deal with non-magnetic materials, so the uh, value of mu zero over mu is one, so they're about the same. And then we can get a relation here between the complex refractive index and the relative epsilon, which um, in layman's terms is what I'll be calculating. And then therefore you have a real part epsilon one and a measured part epsilon two. Now just to clarify real quick, um, my methods involve calculating epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 directly through computational methods and then from there calculating um, n and kappa through these algebraic relations. And you can also calculate other optical coefficients from there as well. While the experimental methods, they determine um, n and kappa through methods such as ellipsometry and then they can calculate epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 from there. Now that's basically how we can check our results between theory and experiment. Now getting into how I actually calculate the properties, I use a package called VASP, the Vienna Evidentio Simulation Package. And what it essentially is, is it's a quantum mechanical simulator and calculator that uses uh, density functional theory. Now in calculating the optical properties, it uses a crazy looking equation to calculate the complex group, the imaginary part of the complex primitivity. So it calculates epsilon 2 and uses a relation to calculate epsilon 1 from the values of epsilon 2. Now in a nutshell, this is basically what that does. It takes four input files and then creates a, a large amount of output files um, and basically, I'll go through the input files real quick. The NCAR file is basically a set of tags that we can use. It, it tells VASP which calculations to run and also has other tags to increase the accuracy of the calculations and so forth. The key points defines a different space, which is called a reciprocal space. Um, it's analogous to the real space in which the, we define the cell. And in that uh, reciprocal space, there are other calculations that are done, such as the band structure, the density of states. Um, in the POSCAR, that's essentially the position file. So you have the cell structure and the ion positions all in that file. And the POPCAR is just a list of potentials that VASP uses in its calculations. Now, before I can go directly into calculating optical properties, there are uh, there's an algorithm of tests that I have to do before uh, getting there so I get an accurate set of results. Um, I'll go into these in depth and have examples. And all the examples that I'll show you are with crystalline silicon. So, 
These are, these are the uh, first tests that I do whenever I am given a new material, the key points and, and cut or energy cutoff tests. Now, what it does is it takes each set of K points or each energy cutoff with everything else constant and it runs the test and finds the energy of the cell. Now, you can see for both tests that the energy seems to be converging. The criteria that we would that we're, we use is um, we want the convergence to be within one milli eV. So as you see here, a 10 by 10 by 10 K points mesh and an energy cutoff of 400 electron volts are the ideal uh, results for accurate calculations. Uh, the next test that I run is the volume test. And what this does is it electronically relaxes the cell and provides the correct cell structure. It takes lattice constants that um, correlate to five different volumes along a given range. It re relaxes each set of each cell based on those uh, lattice constants and it creates a sort of parabolic fit. And at the minimum of this fit, that is the um, relaxed structure and that's how puts the equilibrium volume and energy here. So we know moving forward that that'll be correct cell structure. The next um, tests that I do are the density of states and band structure tests. Now these is, this is um, the two independent ways to get the band gap, which and then from the band gap we can also check the optical properties, so that's the reason we do it. So for the density of states, the band gap is represented here by this um, portion of the graph where there are no states available, and that's calculated to be 0 0.6, 1012 electron volts. And for the band structure, we have, it's the gap between the top of the conduction band and the bottom of the valence band. And then the gap here vertically would be about 0 0.6, 105 electron volts. Now there's a discrepancy, because I'm doing this with silicon, there's a huge discrepancy between the experimental band gap and the calculated band gap, but I'll get to that in just a second. So this is the preliminary run that I did with optical properties. With the NCAR tag, there's a single tag that I can use to just tell BAF to run just the optical properties. However, there are more tags that I can change as well to get more accurate results there, which is why I call this the preliminary run. Now to get into some theory um, real quick, density functional theory basically takes a many electron system and instead of creating a uh, system where each electron has interacts with each other and having a, a messy sort of uh, equation you can get this um, a system of non-interacting pseudo particles and it basically gives you an, an effective potential and a much easier equation now and as this is all dependent on the density of the electrons, and because it's a function of a function, which is also called a functional, hence we get the name density functional theory. Um, so that's essentially the kind of calculations that VASP runs in general. Now getting into the optics part, this density functional theory uses this density functional, which is exchange correlation potential, to um, describe the electron interaction terms. But uh, what we, we can use an approximation called the Hartree-Bach approximation. Um, well, these, are, these boxes are supposed to be primes. Because they're prime, prime. But for each of these theories, we have um, problems with the band gap. The BFT has too small of band gaps, while the Hartree-Bach tends to have much too large band gaps. So we can take a fraction of each approximation, and uh, what empirically has been determined is one fourth Hartree Bach approximation and three fourths um, TFT is, tends to be a good um, correction for most materials in terms of data. Now, as a result of this, we can also change another set of parameters, which is mathematically above my head, but as a result, we can also do something called hybrid orbitals. Um, and as you can see by this graph, this red line represents a perfect match between experimental band gaps and theoretical band gaps. 
the purely DFT, which is from this, is in just the exchange correlation potential, tends to have extremely small band gaps. But this HIC here, which is a type of hybrid orbital, um, you can see it tends to have much better band gaps. Now, taking all this into consideration, we get a modified run, so to speak, which is, um, so the blue is a modified run, the red is the control run, or the first run, the preliminary run that I did, while the black is ex uh, experimental data that I found. And you can see that the blue t is, in general, much closer uh, to the experimental data than the control is. So. And that tends to be the best that I found that theory can do. So now, going from here, for the, because all of these tests were done with silicon, um, my next steps would be to work on a more complex material such as a binary. Uh, right now, I'm doing calculations with gallium arsenide, and hopefully, if everything goes well, um, I'll be able to move on to research material, and then I can compare that with the experimental data that we found as well. So, uh, thank you. Any questions for Tim? Do you have any idea about why the hybrid orbitals may work a little better? Is it because of the charge, you're accounting for the charge distribution a little bit better with those orbitals uh, when mixed in with the, the cloud? To be completely honest, the physics is kind of above my head. Yeah. I mean, it just, it comes down to I can change uh, some parameters, and such as like there's a, there's a uh, range separation parameter which kind of defines what kind of hybrid orbital you can use. And it's just, in terms of changing the number, you get better results. So. How about the hybrid orbital? Is it only allowed to be used with certain species like silicon or, or um, can it use I, it? I think it can be used with pretty much everything. So. You might expand on that a little bit. The astronomers say with three parameters, we can describe an elephant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is it true that, I mean, you say, using hybrid orbitals, and then you say, to match the experiment better. Yeah. So how do you approach a new material that you don't have any experimental data for? Well, the idea is, in, in the, best, the best case scenario, we would have found some sort of theoretical data to match. Um, with silicon net, seem to be very difficult. So with this binary of the gallium arsenide, we actually have some theoretical data that we can try to match. Um, basically what my goal was is to see what the tags that, in, that increase the accuracy do. So like, for example, here's a good example here. You can change the, in fact you can change the percentage of partial clock approximation. So you can see, as you change the numbers here, the graph moves to the right. Or like, and that's the same for all these other tags. You can you see the changes in the graph, and like, based on that, you can get a good idea of what each parameter means physically. So, uh, Lawrence, can I uh, take a stab at your answer? <laughs> the, the point is that uh, he showed a very small aspect of the theory. That, uh, he was matching with this parameter, the band gap. Right. But what is happening is with density functional theory, without this one quarter, three quarter, uh, it's an ab initio theory, meaning we just put in the single atom parameters into the theory. Right. And out come the properties, mechanical, cohesive energies, reaction enthalpies, within 10, 20% of experiment, of millions of compounds, just by single atom inputs, experimental inputs. So in that sense, it's a very general theory. So that's just density functional theory without this uh, hybrids. Now what the hybrids are doing is they are fixing the optical properties uh, to a large extent, which <coughs> density functional theory cannot do. And once these are done, they have been tested for at least a few hundred compounds. 
and this seems to fix the error uh, of the band gap. Uh, this uh, error with the electron hole correlation uh, and so on. So there is some systematics in choosing this sort of thing. Uh, and then it fixes the optical properties for, again, a large class of compounds. Uh, so it's not so much that you go and fix it for one material. It's, it's, there is more to the theory that you, you didn't explain. For him, it's just an operational uh, mm -hmm. item. But, but to get to this one quarter, three quarter result, to put this in perspective, the search for it has been going on for about 20 years. And there must have been at least 10 to 30 PhDs trying to get to this level of hybrid functionals and all of that. Uh, Sandy, is, is the hybrid though adjusting the uh, charge distribution in a certain way or is it not really uh, doing that at all? It's I think it gets the exact exchange part of the exchange the correlation. Exchange part. Oh. So the exchange part becomes exact. Okay. That's my impression. Yeah. yeah. So it, it does, yeah. So, so I have a follow-up question, which is aren't there higher levels of DFT like uh, LDA plus U and GW yeah. that would solve these problems more completely or not? Yeah, but they are, they, they'll be probably 10 to 100 times more expensive. Yeah, like GW, to, no, yes, yes, GW, yeah, yeah. Right. This yeah. quantum Monte Carlo, so, oh, there's higher level stuff which will fix right. this problem. Yeah, quantum Monte Carlo is yeah. other technology. Right, right, but, yeah. but they are, the, again, they have to be uh, doable on a large scale for thousands of materials. So, yeah. so that's where the challenge comes in. So it's the optimization of what you want to do and what level of accuracy you want. Yeah, yes. All right. Let's thank you again.